The other problem we have is this incredible ability to adapt to diminishment. And this served us really well 10, 12, 20,000 years ago when we had to adapt to diminishment and we became very good at it. The problem is today is we're rapidly adapting to diminishment of things which are necessary for our survival. As one species disappears, we simply move on to another species. In the 1990s, orange roughy, a fish that was caught mainly around New Zealand, was in supermarkets around the world. I remember it quite vividly. And uh, it was, was much in demand. The problem with orange roughy is that unlike salmon, which take four years to become sexually mature and dies, the orange roughy takes 50 years or 45, 45 years to become sexually mature and lives to be 200 years of age. That kind of fish cannot keep up with our demand. And so they were overfished and haven't recovered. Just as the Northern Atlantic cod, its population crashed in 1992, it has not recovered. So this is, um, this adaptation to diminish is the reason for that. If this was 1965 and I were to say to you, you know, in 40 years time, you're going to be buying water in plastic bottles. And you're going to be paying more for that water than the equivalent amount of gasoline. You would have looked at me like, nobody's going to do that. But here we are. I was in a hotel in New York and they had a liter of water. I could buy it if I wanted it. It was $12 a liter. $12 a liter for water in a country where gasoline was selling what four to five dollars a gallon. So that's $12. Uh, so that's $48 a gallon is what they were asking for that water. I mean, it's outrageous, but that's the reason Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and all these other companies are uh, heavily invested in the water industry because, you know, there was no water industry back in the 50s and 60s. You wanted a glass of water, it came out of the tap. And uh, that, and even when it's healthy water, we don't drink it if it comes out of a tap. I mean, New York City water is probably the healthiest water in the country. And in fact, it's so healthy that uh, they actually sell bottles of it in Los Angeles, bottled as New York City tap water. You know, so, but we've come so accustomed, so accustomed to buying water in bottles and cans. And at the same time, going through a billion plastic containers every year in all of these water co uh, companies. And even the aluminum containers inside every aluminum can is a plastic liner. So you don't get around that. And that, of course, has led to plastic pollutions in the sea to a point where it's so out of control that by 2040, there'll probably be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And the real problem is microplastics. When them, they break down into those microparticles, which get into the bodies of fish, if you eat fish, you've got microplastics in your body. And uh, they get into the zoo, zooplankton and, you know, comes from all sorts of sources. One of the major contributors that was discovered in a, uh, a study off of Norway was that uh, was automobile tires, not the whole tire, but the tiny bits that come off as you drive down the, uh, uh, the the freeway or the highway. And those tiny bits are washed into the drains and that ends up into the marine ecosystem. So microplastics are gonna become a major, major problem. Other problems in the ocean, of course, are noise pollution. And uh, even for the best of intentions, I mean, for instance, the construction of uh, wind turbines off the East Coast is going to lead to the killing of many, many whales, dolphins, and other species because of the incredibly high decibel levels, not from the windmills, but from the, uh, the pile drivers that are used to drive these gigantic uh, piles 30, 40 meters into the ground. Now, there are alternatives. They could use concrete, large concrete boxes that then could be sunk and would be able to hold the thing, but that's a more expensive technology. So rather than spend the money on that technology, they'd rather go with the pile driving and pile driving will kill enormous amounts of marine uh, life because life in the sea cannot engage in that kind of, uh, that kind of high decibel levels. One of the other things about our anthropocentrism is that uh, we have this feeling or this belief or understanding that we're the most intelligent species on the planet. <laughs> we really believe that. I was debating a whaler in Norway one time and he said, Watson, you say whales are more intelligent than people. How could you say anything so stupid? And I said, well, George, I happen to measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with our ecosystems. And by that criteria, whales are more intelligent than we are. And his answer to that was, well, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. And I said, George, 
you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to tell you. Yes, all species are intelligent in accordance to their position within the ecosystem. And uh, their primary function is to survive within that ecosystem and to contribute at the same time. We're now coming to an understanding where trees and plants communicate with each other. You know, like they don't talk to each other, but they certainly communicate through a fungal network. And um, we know that whales communicate with each other, dolphins communicate with each other. And again, we already come down to the intelligence. What, what is a measure of intelligence to us? It's, it's tools. Hand-to-eye coordination, the ability to make tools, that's what we define as intelligence. If a blob of protoplasm stepped out of a spaceship in front of us and it had a ray gun, well, that thing is obviously intelligent because it's got technology. But how do you measure intelligence which is non-manipulative, that doesn't have a need for tools? The human brain is approximately 700 cubic centimeters. The orca brain is 6,000 cubic centimeters. The sperm whale brain is 9,000 cubic centimeters, the largest brain to ever evolve on the planet. And cetacean brains are far more complex than human brains. The convolutions on the neocortex area are far more pronounced, and they have four lobes of the brain to where we have three. Their communication abilities are incredible. We just don't understand it. But, you know, who are we to say that they are not intelligent? Who are we to destroy them for our petty needs because we believe that they're inferior. It's sort of the same attitude of the Ubermunch, you know, the inferior human beings while we look down on other species as being inferior to us. But they feel, they see, they dream, they understand, they love, they communicate. We know that. And yet we choose to not know it. We want to love our dogs, but we want to eat our pigs is really what it comes down to. We just sort of detach from the reality of what we're doing to the pigs. And then we go and pet our dogs and say, good boy. Uh, so it's this ability to do that detachment, which is, a, which really is, I think, I find, think is a form of mental illness, really. So that's, uh, you know, a situation there that we have with that. Now, over the years, I've uh, managed to... Um, get a lot of things done through an understanding of the culture that we live in. We live in a media culture, and that's why I've always held the uh, view that the most powerful weapon on the planet is the camera. And uh, with the camera, we can achieve a lot. That's one of the reasons we did our own television show called Whale Wars, that we do documentaries like Sea Spiracy and uh, Sea of Shadows, and that is because we know that to reach people, the camera is the way to do it. The camera is far more powerful than, than the gun. And uh, again, in a media culture, you have to understand how that works because the media, we're talking about the mainstream media here. They only under, the, the mainstream media only understands four elements, four things, there's four elements of media, sex, scandal, violence, and celebrity. If it doesn't have one of those elements, it's not even a news story. It has all of those elements, you got yourself a super story. I learned this lesson uh, quite, uh, <laughs> vividly back in 1979, no, excuse me, 1977, when I took Bridget Bardot out to the ice flows in Newfoundland to get her picture taken with baby seals. Her picture, cheek to cheek with a baby seal, that gave us a cover of every major magazine on the planet. And that's when I realized celebrity is a, is a, a tactic that can be used. And that's one of the reasons that we built up a celebrity board of advisors over the years. And I sort of jokingly say that because we, you know, have Pierce Brosnan and uh, oh, Richard Dean Anderson and uh, let me see, and uh, Christian Bale and others that how can we lose? We got we got Batman, we've got uh, MacGyver, we got uh, and we got Captain Kirk. So, you know, we can't lose. We also got the president of the United States, Martin Sheen. A lot of people actually think he was president of the United States, strangely enough. But as a. Uh, Rudger Hauer once said to me, he said, yeah, we don't really know a lot, but everybody thinks we know a lot. So we might as well put that to good use. And so when we come out and champion a cause, we get listened to. And that is a reality of that. Back in um, 1984, I, I organized a campaign to stop the killing of wolves in British Columbia and the Yukon. And it was a highly successful media campaign. It gave us headlines for two solid weeks across Canada. And because it had all four elements, it had them uh, killing wolves uh, 
in from helicopters. They're violent. They're threats to kill us if we interfered. Violence. Um, we had an environment minister who we exposed taking a bribe from big game hunting organizations. Scandal. I recruited Bo Derrick as our spokesperson for that campaign. At the press conference, uh, a reporter for the Vancouver Sun said, come on, what does Bo Derrick know about wolves? This is stupid having her as your director. I said, well, if I had the best wolf biologist in the world, Dr. Gordon Haver, Dr. David Mack, it'd be an empty room, but because uh, she's here, uh, it'll be the front page of story of your newspaper tomorrow, and there's nothing you can do about it. And of course, that it was. Just a few years ago, I had to deal with a problem where they had captive orcas and belugas in Russia. We wanted to get the Russian government to release them. I wrote a speech to the Russian parliament. They're not going to listen to me. That, I understood that. So I simply sent Pamela Anderson over to deliver that speech. And the belugas and orcas were released. So again, that shows the power of celebrity. And it's something that we've used over the years quite effectively. And again, with the media, there's always a perception that what we're doing or have done is illegal or wrong. And, you know, I once I did the Bill Maher show one time and uh, he said, well, some people call you an eco-terrorist. And I said, well, I've never worked for Monsanto, so I don't think that that, uh, that applies. And the fact is, we've never injured anybody. What is aggressive nonviolence? If a person is about to shoot an elephant, and you hit the, knock the gun out of his hand, don't hurt him, but knock the gun out of his hand, save the elephant's life. That is an act of nonviolence. Uh, as Martin Luther King once said, uh, that you cannot commit violence against a non-sentient object. You know, it's a protection of life that remains important. A few years ago, there was an incident in Zimbabwe where a ranger shot and killed uh, a poacher who was about to kill a black rhinoceros. And human rights groups around the world attacked him viciously. How dare you take the life of a human being, protect an animal? And his response, I think, was very uh, revealing. He said, well, if I was a police officer in Harare and a man ran up out of Barclays Bank with a bag of paper money and I shot him in the head and killed him, you'd call me a hero and pin a medal on me. So why is a bag of paper worth more than the future heritage of the whole nation of Zimbabwe? It's that kind of hypocrisy within human beings, I think, that is part of our problem, is that we value things. We don't value life. You know, imagine, if you will, going into the city of Mecca, walking up to the black stone and spitting on it. Well, your chances of walking out alive from that city are somewhat remote. You're walking to Tel Aviv and attack uh, the Wailing Wall with a pickaxe, and you're going to get an Israeli soldier's bullet in the back. Or walk into Rome and attack the Pieta with a hammer, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're attacking something which is sacred, which means something to so many people. Yet every day, we walk into the most beautiful, most pristine cathedrals of the natural world, the rainforest of Amazonia, the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia, and we desecrate these cathedrals with bulldozers and dredgers and chainsaws. And how do we respond? Uh, we send a few petitions in, write letters to the politicians, whatever. But if the, uh, if the rainforest of Amazonia or the Great Barrier Reef of, uh, of Australia were as value to us, our, uh, we consider them as sacred, like we do an old meteorite in Mecca, a chunk of marble in Rome or an old wall in Tel Aviv, we would be outraged and we would rise up and defend it. But we don't get that outraged over these things because they're, they don't mean that much to us. I, I kind of like the Dalai Lama's response when they blew up the, uh, the Taliban, blew up the uh, statues in Afghanistan, the Buddhist statues, and everybody was outraged except for the Dalai Lama. And he said, we're just stones. He says, it means nothing and everything. They're non-sentient objects and everything. And so he understood that. Back in 1985, I actually uh, received a visit from two uh, Tibetan monks, and uh, they gave me uh, this small little colorful statue of sort of a dragon and horse combination. And uh, they said, you can put it up on your mass for protection. And 
you know, I'm not a very superstitious person, but okay, I'll put it up on the mask. And I didn't think anything up there. It was up there for a number of years. And um, then in 1989, I had the opportunity to uh, have lunch with the Dalai Lama in Washington. And I asked him the question. I showed him a picture of it. I said, what is this? And he says, it's, well, it's called Hayagriva. And I said, what's that mean? He says, well, it's the compassionate aspect of the wrath of the Buddha. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, you never want to hurt anybody, but sometimes when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. <laughs> and, he, and he said that with a laugh. And so he understood that that was what we were trying to do. That's, and that's why I was able to get his endorsement for the work that we were doing. And uh, it's because he understood that we were trying to make people aware of the reality of what we're doing to the natural world. But at the same time, to not hurt anybody in the process. There can be never can be any justification for, uh, for the taking of life or the injuring of another person. And you know, I'm proud of the unblemished record that I've had over the last half a century, really, and not, not doing that. But even prouder still of the lives we saved, the 6,500 whales that we saved in the Southern Ocean when we drove the Japanese whaling fleet out of the Southern Ocean. It took 10 years of confrontations, but every year we cut into their quotas by blocking, harassing, and preventing them from killing whales. And it was a very successful campaign because of that. And uh, finally, they were driven out. Unfortunately, it looks like they might be going back. And if they do go back, well, we'll have to be prepared to be there. This summer, I'm taking a, a ship to uh, the North Atlantic, to Iceland, where uh, this one guy who is a modern day Captain Ahab called Christian Lawson, uh, he wants to kill up to 169 endangered fin whales, which is a violation of the International Whaling Commission's global moratorium on whaling. And uh, we intend to save those whales. So we're going to be going up there to do just that using that strategy of aggressive nonviolence. And uh, I'm confident that we'll be able to make a difference. And then we can move on to protecting um, whales off the coast of Norway. And that there's always something to do. And uh, you know, the, the, the only way we can do that is through hands-on uh, operations. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, we've been able to achieve all of this because of the passion, the imagination, and the courage of all of those people, those, those volunteers that have worked with me over the years and continue to do so. You can't really buy that kind of, you know, loyalty and allegiance. Um, <clears throat> I used to ask, and still do actually, ask crew members, are you willing to risk your life to protect a whale? And if they say no, then I said, well, then <clears throat> we, we can't use you. And, you know, journalists have asked me, well, that's a little unreasonable, asking people to risk their life to protect a whale. I said, well, I don't think so in our culture. Uh, we ask young people to not only risk their life, but to give their life for wars over real estate and oil wells and religion and, and, and flags and things like this. I think it's a far more noble pursuit to risk your life to protect an endangered species or to protect a, an endangered ecosystem. We just have to get our priorities right. Why are we willing to die for oil wells, but we're not willing to die to pr protect life on, on this planet? You know, people ask me, well, why don't uh, you pursue this politically? Well, the problem with politics is that they can't really make decisions because it's the art of the possible. Any politician who actually steps up to the plate and does something that's going to really make a difference is going to get voted out at the next election or overthrown if it's an autocratic sort of person. You know, the public wants things to change, but they don't really want to change. And when somebody comes around and begins to change things, well, you know, they don't really appreciate that. I remember in 2015 at the... Uh, at the COP21 conference. Uh, the darling of the conference was Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau. And uh, he was gonna do this. He was gonna be uh, uh, address indigenous rights. He was gonna protect the environment, but he had just been elected and he could say those things. He went back to Canada and championed the Power Sands project, the pipelines, the, uh, you know, going through indigenous lands, uh, broke every promise he made, which is pretty par, par for the course for, for, for many, many politicians. So you just can't do these things uh, through the political structure. All change comes through the passion and the courage of individuals. I think it was anthropologist Margaret Mead who said that quite eloquently. And uh, she said, don't expect governments or corporations to change the world. They never have, they never will. It comes through the passion of individuals and individuals can make such a difference. Look what Greta Thunberg has uh, been able to do 
high school girl. And she's been able to re- meet down with leaders and talk to people and get her word out to millions of people. You know, because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Because of David Wingate, we still have the Bermuda storm petrel in Bermuda. So many people around the world who have made a real difference because they were passionately got involved with something. And when uh, young people ask me, well, what should I do? I just say, find something that you're passionate about and apply yourself. Use your skills and your abilities towards doing what you can to address that issue. Even if it's a seemingly impossible task, because you got to remember that the answer to an impossible problem is the impossible solution. And that is found through passion, courage, and imagination. The very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would one day be president of South Africa was unthinkable and therefore impossible. And yet the impossible happened. I believe that that impossible solutions can be found. And also, I don't think that there's any need to be pessimistic or depressed about the state of the world or the future, especially not for the future. Back in 1973, I volunteered for the American Indian Movement to be a medic in, uh, during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. We were surrounded by 3,500 federal agents who were shooting into the village. They killed two, wounded 46. And uh, I went to speak with Russell Means, who is a leader for the American Indian Movement, he and Dennis Banks. And I said, uh, Russell, we, I mean, we, we don't have any hope of winning here. The odds against us are overwhelming. So what are we doing? And his answer to me has stayed with me throughout the years. He said, well, we're not concerned about the odds against us. We're not concerned about winning or losing. We're here because it's the right thing to do, the right place to be, and uh, the right time to do it. Don't worry about the future. Focus on the present. You have no power over the future, but you have absolute power over the present. What you do in the present will define what the future will be. And that's really how we have to, should really look at this. What can we do now that's going to make this a better world? Let's not worry about the future. Let's work in the present to define that future. And uh, so I have hope, I mean, but we also have to face the reality of this. Young people, especially, people who were born in this century, they will never ever see what I saw uh, when I was younger, when I was a child. I happen to live in the most materially wealthy, freest time in the history of humanity. It'll never come again, never come again. We don't have the resources to, uh, to continue to support that. I had a pretty good idea of what the world was gonna be like when I got older. Young people today don't have that. They don't know what the world is gonna be like in 2040, 2050, or 2070. They have no idea. There are so many challenges, so many obstacles, so many things that could happen. So, but the one thing is for sure, they know that something has to be done and that they have to apply that. And that's why I tell them to pursue what they're passionate about. And don't let anybody, anybody deter you, especially older people tell you, you can't do that, or that's impossible. Nothing is impossible. Uh, if you apply it. And uh, so that's what I'm, uh, I'm hoping that uh, there will be more and more enlightenment about that. But there has been a lot of change. 1972, we took out a billboard <laughs> in Vancouver and it said, one giant word in yellow, it said ecology. And underneath in smaller letters, look it up, get involved. Nobody even knew what the word ecology meant back then. In 1980, nobody really knew what a vegan was. They thought maybe it was somebody from the planet Vega or something, but it, it was unknown, really. And now you find vegan restaurants in places all over the world, and uh, so, which is really an indication of growing awareness. I believe that a plant-based diet, veganism, and everything is a solution to addressing uh, climate change. Of course, it's a difficult one to sell because, again, our culture is so, uh, you know, set on the fact that we have to eat meat and animal products and that if we don't, it's unhealthy, which is simply not true. I mean, look at the mountain gorilla doesn't eat any meat and nothing, <laughs> there's no human being can eat. They equate the strength of that. In fact, the most strongest, most powerful animals happen to be herbivores. And, you know, maybe, and when people say, well, we, we, we began as a meat eating culture or Perhaps, first of all, we probably began as plant eaters and then we went to meat eaters, but that was then. We don't need that now. There's no place on this planet for 8 billion to 10 or 12 billion 
meat-eating, fish-eating primates. It's, a, it's an unnatural state. The, the animal base can simply not re- support that without gross factory farming operations. And by the way, about 40% of all of the fish that's taken from the ocean is rendered into fish meal, which is fed to pigs and chickens and salmon and other creatures like that. So we live in a world where chickens eat more fish than puffins and albatrosses, where pigs eat more fish than sharks, and where cats, where domestic cats, eat more fish than all the seals in the North Atlantic Ocean. You know, and of course, when the fish populations become diminished, who do we blame? Seals, whales, seabirds. Just reduce those populations, that'll solve the problem. Let's just make them the scapegoats for our avarice, for our greed. And uh, so, you know, it's our willful ignorance that's just leading to this incredible, this incredible demise. And it is an incredible demise, but for the most part, it's out of sight and out of mind. We, we don't want to see the truth. We don't want to hear the truth. We want to continue to live this dream that we're special, that all of this is owed to us. Every other species in this planet owes us something, but we also owe something too. Now, I'm not saying human beings are useless. In fact, one of the things I have come to understand is that uh, uh, there, there is one great use for, for humanity, and that is if we're ever really threatened by a meteorite or an asteroid, we at least have the technological capability to save the planet from that. So that's uh, that could be our contribution. But other than that, we've been very, very destructive. And uh, right now there's 4 million fishing vessels out on the ocean, 4 million vessels out on the ocean using everything from 100 mile long gill nets, 100 mile long long lines, giant purse seiners, super trawlers. I mean, ships that cost $200 million to build. You got to catch a lot of fish in order to pay off the banks that lent you the money for that kind of thing. And it's what I call the economics of extinction, the investment in extinction. There's money to be made by driving species into extinction because scarcity translates into more price, higher prices for demand. Bluefin tuna is a good example, one of the most endangered fish in the sea, but still being fished. And uh, it's um, one bluefin tuna can go for 75 to a million dollars a piece, one fish. So it's the most expensive fish on the, on the planet. And primarily it's being sold in Japan. Now, Mitsubishi as a company has about a 10 to 15 year supply of bluefin tuna locked up in freezers in uh, Japan. They could stop fishing today and still have a uh, the fish to provide to their customers for the next 10 years. They could easily do that. But here's what happens if they do. The fish population in the sea will begin to increase. And instead of being diminished, there'll be more bluefin tuna, which now will decrease the value of the fish that's in their warehouses. So they don't wanna see that. And if the bluefin were to go extinct, <clears throat> then they're sitting on a priceless commodity that they can you know, set their own price. And the fishing industries today, they're not fishermen out in little boats. The fishing industry today is all about short-term investment or short-term gain. Let's get out there and get as much as we can. You know, I was challenging Spanish and Cuban drag trawlers off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland back in the, in the 90s. And uh, captain of the Spanish trawler, when confronted about the fact that he was going after Northern Cod, which were now being protected off of Canada, he said, well, you know, we know they're going to be going extinct, so we might as well make as much money off it as we possibly can. So again, investment uh, in extinction. It's also called the tragedy of the commons. Well, if we don't fish it, then the Canadians will, or the, or the uh, Norwegians will, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot of contradictions, a lot of things to really deal, but it really comes down to greed, which is driving all, all of this. And this idea that, there are no limits to growth. There are no limits to resources when in fact, we know there is. The, uh, where do we go from here now? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so we're, um, I thought, well, I probably could open up to questions right now. Might think of a few things along the line, but uh, yeah, we can open up to questions if you like. Sure, thank you, excuse me. Thank you for that very powerful, uh, talk that was uh that was very moving so um we're going to open up to questions and as part of that um before before we do that i just wanted to um let people know if you could let people know 
um, how to find you online and perhaps get involved in your um, in your project, in your latest project? Uh, yeah, you can find us on uh, CaptainPaulWatson.com, uh, CaptainPaulWatsonFoundation.com, and just put in Captain Paul Watson, you know, it'll lead it to, and yeah, this is your list of some of my books. Uh, the last one, We Are the Ocean, is a children's book. And, uh, uh, I, that's been one of the more important books, I think, that I've, uh, that I've written. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to open it up to, to the audience if they would like to ask any questions. And um, we are, I just want to explain real quickly how we do that. We are not going to take questions via chat. We are going to be using the Zoom hand raise. So if you don't know how to do that, you're going to go to the bottom of the Zoom window. Second to the right, you'll see the reactions button. And you'll click on that and then select raise hand from the function menu. We will take questions in the order in which they received. When it's your turn, I will unmute you. I will ask for your name, where you're from, and for you to state your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you. In order to give everyone a chance to get their question in, we will not allow follow-up questions in the same session. However, if you do wish to ask a follow-up question, you can raise your hand and um, again and get on the back of the uh, on the back of the line. So, all right. So, with that, um, so all right. So, your website is the best way for people to get get involved with yes. the. Also, be found on Instagram and Twitter and the usual social networks. You know, just put in the. Thank you. And and what does get involved getting involved look like for uh, for people who are interested? Well, there's two ways to get involved. One is crewing on the ship. We have one ship now, but we're going to get more. And also, uh, as shore supporters, helping to uh, you know to to work to uh, you know finance and uh, to manage the, the ships uh, and that with supplies and things like this. We're basically a navy, so we need a support base. Okay. Okay. Great. So I, I'm sure I, I'm I'm gonna say this wrong. Well, actually, I'll just ask you how to say it. the the oil that they get from sperm whales is what what kind of oil? Two types of oil: sperm oil and spermaceti oil. The sperm oil comes uh, pressed out of the the muscles, the blubber, you know, the meat. Uh, but the spermaceti oil is found in the brain, in the in the head of the whale. Okay. And is there any you know you said that they were used for inter ballistic or intercontinental ballistic missiles? I believe. Yeah, um, oil is very high heat resistant, so it makes an excellent lubricating oil. Uh, there is a plant equivalent, which can be found in jojoba oil, actually. Okay, and are they using that instead, or are they still just going for the whales? Uh, they're not using it now, So, uh, but the Soviet Union was using it for a long time. Uh, the United States still uses it, but they're, they're, they're going into uh, supplies from decades ago that they've held on to. Thank you. One of our uh, previous speakers was talking about the promise of deep ocean agriculture. What are your thoughts on that? And I do know that one of the real problems facing us right now is deep ocean mining and the uh, going after magnesium uh, nodules on the bottom of the ocean, which is going to create incredible uh, ecological havoc on the on the bottom of the ocean, setting up, a, you know, creating uh, debris, uh, dust, kind of like which is going to cover everything, causing a lot of lo loss of oxygen. It's a real problem. Ocean mining is a major problem. But I'm actually not familiar with uh, deep ocean uh, uh, agriculture. I'm not really familiar. With yeah, you're talking about like a, putting a pipe down like 500, 500 feet or so in the water in the ocean and doing some sort of agriculture down there. Um, I think some of it was for, you know with was with fish, and some of it was with with plants as well. You're not you're not familiar with that. No, I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> it sounds intriguing, but uh, no. Okay, okay. And um, when do you expect the fish population? So, so uh, obviously, there's economics that you're talking about in in the fishing industry. When do you expect that the fish population will be so diminished that these businesses won't be able to sustain themselves on on the fishing business? Well, we're seeing the uh, the collapse of fishing industries around the world. Like I mentioned before, the northern cod fishery collapsed in 92 and was not recovered. Uh, and so this is happening more and more. Uh, Dr. Boris Worm, Dr. Uh, oh, is it Daniel, so mainly Boris Worm, and he uh, pr predicted 2048, but that's been renewed to about 2070. So it's between 2048 and 2070 when they predict the, uh, Daniel Pauly is the other oceanographer, 
fish biologist. Uh, so it's between 2048 and 2070 that they'll have a state of a commercial collapse of the fishing industry, that not enough fish for the commercial industry to continue to, to go fishing. Personally, I think it'll happen by between 2030, 2040, because we're seeing a steady decline because there's other factors in addition to overfishing, which is uh, noise pollution, chemical pollution, plastic pollution, other things. So uh, there are many factors contributing to that. Okay, and what what do you expect when what, what do you expect to see as a as a result when when that happens? Will people just stop eating fish at that point? I think we'll probably see worldwide starvation, especially along third uh, third world nations. You know, when they talk about um, a sustainable fishery, what is a sustainable fishery? There's no such thing. I mean, unless you're in a canoe going off the coast of the Congo or out of the Philippines and catching fish by hand, that is sustainable. There's no such thing as commercial sustainability. It's a, it's a word that really doesn't mean anything. For instance, uh, the fishery for Antarctic and Patagonia toothfish, uh, you don't see that on your menus because it's marketed as Chilean sea bass. It's not from Chile and it's not a bass, but that's a marketing term. But uh, they, they catch this fish in the Southern Ocean. Now, we went down to the Southern Ocean 2015 and uh, to go after the most, uh, after six poaching vessels that were taking toothfish. One of the mo most notorious was called the Thunder. As soon as we arrived, it ran and dropped its net. Our other ship picked up that net. It took 200 hours to pull a net from two kilometers from the, bottom, uh, from the surface. And that net was 72 kilometers long and weighed 70 tons, one net from one ship. That's the kind of technology that they're using. Now, they, you know, then there's a legal fishery, like austral fisheries and the Japanese go down, they have this so-called legal fishery, and that, which they actually call, have the nerve to call sustainable. But how do you call a fish sustainable that's caught in the Southern Ocean then taken back to land and then is put onto an airplane and flown in a frozen compartment to Paris, to London, to New York, to be served in exclusive restaurants. That's not sustainable. It's an heavily carbon intensive uh, practice. And it's, you know, it's, there's no need for it. There really is no need for it. And uh, so, you know, when this fishing industry says, well, people are dependent upon fishing. Yes, millions of people are, but not their, not their customers. We're talking about people who actually are dependent upon fisheries, people in West Africa, or East Africa, and, and the, you know, in the Philippines, places like that, where they actually need it. And that would cause serious problems if they disappear. And the reason they're going to be disappearing is because the greed of the fishing industry. Last year, we caught a super trawler in the Bay of Biscay, got on it just at the right time. It had emptied its net, it had dropped its net, and 150,000 blue whiting were floating on the surface dead. Why? It was a bycatch. They didn't want blue whiting. They were caught by accident, so just dump them. The, the, the bycatch in the commercial fishing industry is enormous. For every kilo of prawns and shrimp, look at 22 kilos of something else that was destroyed in the process of catching that. So it's um, a very highly destructive uh, industry, this commercial fishing operation. And it's also a good percentage of the marine debris, the plastics in the oceans come from the fishing industry. I remember as a child, I could walk the beaches in Eastern Canada, uh, you know, I was raised in a fishing village and uh, never saw a piece of plastic ever. The fish flows were made out of glass and the, the nets were made out of uh, biodegradable rope. Of course, that doesn't exist anymore. 